All right. Well, let me go ahead and share my screen first. Uh, but while I do that, I just wanted to say that I'm super excited for this opportunity. I've been really excited to talk to all of you about sort of what I do and kind of the, I don't know, when we think about scientists, we don't think about them working in art museums, right? So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you all about what we do as scientists in museums and kind of some of the problems that we can solve and the different types of tools to you know, solve those problems, answer those questions. I'll recently remember that Bitmoji was a thing. So I had like a ton of fun making like lots of different Bitmojis. It was a good time. Um, and you can call me either Dr. Z or Dr. Stephanie or Dr. Zaleski. Uh, I will answer to any of those. And please go ahead and type in the chat, ask any questions that you have. Um, and I will be asking you some things as we go on uh, in this conversation. All right, so before we begin, um, I kind of just want to start with like a little introduction about who I am, um, some fun facts about me. So here's a picture of me. This is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, uh, where I did research for one year when I was in college and then one year after I got my PhD. Uh, so I'm actually originally from New York. Um, so, you know, I'm a, <laughs> now I'm in brand new Californian. I've been living in the Bay Area for about a year. Uh, but I'm originally from the New York City area. Uh, you know, yes. when I was when I was in school, uh, I wanted to be, I actually really wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be a cartoonist or maybe a scientist. And now I started to do a little bit of both, which is kind of nice. Um, when I'm not working in the lab, uh, I like to hang out with my dog. I have like a corgi mix. She's very cute. I like to cook. I like doing crafts like knitting. And I also like listening to music. Um, and my favorite like art style is surrealism. So you can take like somebody like Salvador Dali, for example, uh, that's kind of always been my favorite art style. So to kind of, you know, people often ask like, oh, you know, where, how did you get involved in like working in a museum? Like that's such a kind of like a weird job. Like how do you find out about something like that? So when I was in college, uh, so I went to college at a place called Barnard College which is a small uh, all women's college in New York City. I was a biochemistry major uh, and I also took lots of art history classes. So when I was there, I found out through a career day at my college uh, about the fact that the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City had a science, like a science department. And I was so excited by that because like, I love chemistry, I love art. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can combine these two things together. This is amazing. So I ended up doing a research internship there for about a year and a half. So this is me in 2010 working on a microscope that actually has a laser attached to it. Uh, and so I did research on studying like binding materials. So you can think about like an oil painting, the binding material is an oil and that people can actually use things like you can use eggs and you can actually mix it with pigment to make a paint. Uh, so we are actually trying to use like biological methods to detect, you know, biological materials used as painting materials. So I got to learn how to use lasers and I still use lasers today because it's super fun and it could give you lots of really good information. Uh, and we mostly use this technique to study kind of like Renaissance, uh, like Italian paintings mostly. And so I was totally hooked at that point And I was like, I'm going to keep doing this. This is so much fun. Look at all this great stuff that you can do. So after I graduated from college, I moved to Chicago. So again, new place for me. Uh, I got a PhD, so I have a doctorate uh, in chemistry, and that took about five years, which is about, it's a lot of school, but it's, it's you know, you're doing research. And then, so here's me in my PhD robes. Uh, I like to call these my wizard robes. They're, I was so excited to wear these uh, when I got my degree. Uh, after I graduated from, you know, I got my, my doctorate, uh, I went back to New York and I worked at the Met for a year and I'll actually talk about some of that work. My project was mostly looking at Japanese woodblock prints. So a really famous one that maybe some of you have seen before is this, uh, is the wave. Um, and so the Met actually has multiple copies of this. Um, and so I actually, some of the work that I was doing was trying to study the pigments uh, that were used in the different blues um, and sort of thinking about some of these pigments being imported uh, from Europe into Japan and sort of kind of tracking that timeline a little bit. 
then I moved to Washington, D.C. for about a year and a half after my fellowship was over and I worked at the Library of Congress. I worked on a lot of glass materials from like the 1800s and something I worked on a lot were uh, like photograph negatives. And so early photograph negatives were actually printed on glass. Um, and so we were actually interested in the like degradation of the, gra the glass and how that could potentially affect the kind of image quality of the negative. So you can see here that we're actually using light to analyze the kind of physical properties of these materials, uh, which is what we're really going to get into uh, the details today. Uh, and then I did another fellowship. I moved back to Chicago and I was working between Northwestern University and the Art Institute of Chicago. And I was studying kind of modern paints. So we were interested in looking at, so you can see these kind of like little white blobs in this, this um, red box here. Those are actually degradation products. And so we were interested in trying to take really, really close up pictures of how these things form. And we were interested in, you know, how quickly do they form? In what types of materials do they form? And how can we, you know, stop that from happening so that we can keep paintings in good condition for as long as possible? And so now I'm in the Bay Area. So here you see we have San Francisco, we got San Jose. So I'm about probably about a five and a half hour drive from, from you all. And now I'm a professor uh, of chemistry at California State University East Bay. So during the year, you know, during the fall and the spring, pretty much from like August to now, uh, I mostly teach, I do a little bit of research. Uh, I teach lots of different things in chemistry. So your general chemistry, uh, I also teach upper level level classes for like juniors and seniors, and we also have some graduate students. So I teach things like using instruments, uh, instrumental analysis, and I also teach physical chemistry and something called spectroscopy, which is using light to study properties of different things. And then I also do a lot of research, and so I am currently working with two museums uh, in the area, the Legion of Honor Museum and the de Young Museum. And I'm working with their conservators um, and we're working on various research projects related to kind of questions that they have in their art collections. So I'm really excited to be here. I just finished my first year of teaching um, and it's really exciting to be in the Bay Area and to be working with these, these folks. All right, so now, we're gonna get into sort of like, what does a museum scientist actually do? And so I wanna open up the floor for you to think a little bit about what kinds of questions do you think we can answer with science when we're like thinking about art? So you've sort of gotten a little bit of a preview, right? You can go ahead and type in the chat, um, you know, anything, anything you could think of. What types of questions do you think we could answer um, using science to ask about, you know, painting, sculptures, photography, modern materials, anything you can think of. Go ahead and type it in the chat. I'll give you, you know, a minute or two. What do you think? Yeah. All right. So we had, when was art piece made? What era? What materials? What artists? That's actually a really good question. Yeah, absolutely. Any other thoughts? You can also, you know, unmute your mic if that's easier. Common beliefs. Okay. Yeah. These are great questions. And these are ones that, that we think about. Yeah. Yeah. So sort of like cultural or historical significance. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those are actually really common things that we, we think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind of a common style, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else have any other thoughts? You know, and if things come up too, feel free to just keep typing. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can, yeah. Things in society, the role of, you know, the role of different people in society and how that's like reflected in art pieces. Yeah, these are, those are like very art historical questions, but we can also use, you know, scientific tools to, uh, to answer those questions. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, thanks so much for, for those. Okay, this is great. So this is a really nice primer. How are the materials made? Uh-huh, 
Yeah, we're actually, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit, how materials are made. Yeah, curious to know why we need so much technology to discover tools from a less technological era. That is really interesting to think about. And we're actually, we're gonna talk about that today too. Awesome, okay, cool. So some of the things that I think about as far as like common questions that come up. So like, you know, you're looking at a painting. What was it made out of? What pigments were they, did they use? What kind of binding material that they did they use to actually spread the paint onto the surface? What kind of surface were they painting on? Was it a canvas? Was it wood? Was it metal? Was it plastic? All those types of things can come up. Where did they come from? So, you know, I talked about very briefly with the Japanese prints that during the kind of when Japan was becoming industrialized in the 18, you know, the mid to late 1800s, that they actually imported a lot of the materials that they use for, for woodblock prints from Europe. Um, and, you know, that actually ties into the fact that they were trying to become this, you know, like industrialized nation and they were westernizing and they wanted to show the world that that was happening. And so that was sort of reflective of the materials that they actually use in their pieces. All right. How did they make the object? How was it built? So with a sculpture, for example, it was like, how did they actually, what was their working process? Is it degraded? So we can see that sometimes with our eyes, right? But we may not know how an object looked, you know, 50, 100, 200 years ago, for example. We don't know. So is, is the art, artwork degraded? Do we know if it's degraded? So if we look at it, how severe is the degradation? So like, is the thing totally falling apart? Can you even touch it? You know, if you look at it, does it crumble? How did the degradation happen? Um, so what was actually the, like, we call that the mechanism of degradation? Um, and how can we actually take steps to prevent further damage? So like, can we, you know, do a surface coating? Can we put it in a really dry environment? Can we put it in a really humid environment? What's actually going to help prevent that from happening? And actually that, that kind of discipline is called preventative conservation and is something that's very important in museums and, you know, like lighting conditions, presence of oxygen, all that kind of stuff. And then this is one that usually comes up a lot, uh, or at least people often think that this is a thing that we ask a lot is like, is it fake? Is it authentic? This is actually a really hard question to answer. And the reason why is because like some types of materials have been used for thousands of years. So if like I find, you know, a pigment that's been something that's been used for thousands of years, I could tell you maybe it's, it may be real, but it may also not be real. But if you have something that's made that said it was made in the 1500s, but you find a modern like 19th century or 1900s pigment in there, you know that there's something funky going on. So it's sometimes tricky to answer, but we we do have the tools to actually ask, you know, or answer a lot of these questions. All right, so just to give you an example, this is a, um, a painting by Pablo Picasso, who maybe some of, some of you have heard of before, maybe not. So this is actually a really nice example that we have where we actually have a color photograph from the 1960s of this painting. So this painting was made in 1907. And so we now have a, a photograph of it today. And so I'm sure that you, you see that in this upper corner here, you have this yellow in the upper corner and you also have this yellow kind of used in this like neck piece right but then in today's version you see that you know it's so faded this area and then this yellow area is really not faded as much and you can see here there's also this yellow too and so scientists did some analysis on the pigments that were used in both of these yellow areas and they found that they actually had the same chemical composition. So they were both made out of this thing called cadmium sulfide, which is, a, is this relatively new at the time in the early 1900s. And so you could ask like, okay, why did they actually behave differently? And so they did all these studies and they eventually found that the, the actual pigment grain size, so like the particle size was actually much smaller and less, therefore less stable in the yellow that was used in this area as opposed to the yellow that was used in this area. 
So again, these are sort of, you know, why do we need these, you know, like new modern technological tools to answer these questions? And one of the things that comes up a lot is that we find something that is degraded. And so the material that's actually left in, intact and that we can still test is sometimes very small in very, very small amounts. So there's that too. And I think this is also kind of speaks to the, the question of like, why do we need these kind of like fancy techniques? Is that, you know, if you're working in a normal science lab, you know, we can cook up samples, we can test things tons and tons of different times, right? When we're working with art, we usually only have one. We have one painting. And ideally we want it to last for like hundreds of years for people to enjoy, right? And so usually we can't, you know, we can't just like chop up the painting and like do all these tests because again, we only have one of it, right? And so one of the, the other kind of tricks, you know, or the questions that comes up that makes this to me like such a fun thing to work on and really challenging, right? Is that like, can we actually take a sample? In a lot of cases you can take a sample, but it's really small. It's like, it's, it's like a tiny little grain. It's like the size of a grain of salt the sample that you typically get. So we are trying to draw out as much information from we, as we possibly can from a sample that is the size of a grain of salt. And so if we take a sample, sometimes you actually need to like consume the sample. So will it actually be consumed? Ideally, again, we don't actually want it to be consumed, right? And then another thing is, so you can see like in this picture, for example, there's me actually working on my microscope in the lab. And this is one of my former colleagues uh, looking at a Picasso painting that we're gonna be talking about a little bit. But sometimes, you know, we need to actually bring the object, the painting, the sculpture, whatever to the lab. Um, so could, can we actually take the artwork and move it from the gallery to the lab or wherever we need to? So these kind of limitations, I don't want to call them limitations, they're challenges, right? These are, you know, we have to build the toolbox, our, our analysis toolbox around these challenges while still trying to get out as much information as we possibly can. And so it turns out that we have a really useful toolbox available to us, and that is the what's called the electromagnetic spectrum. You can also think of this as light. And so we can actually only see a really, really small fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we know this as visible light. So for those of you who may not have introduced to this, light has a property known as a wavelength. And so you can think of the wavelength as if measuring from a bottom of a bottom to a top to a top. So our eyes can actually only pick up certain wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. And that ends up being what we know is the visible range, which is about, this is 800 nanometers. So that's 10 to the minus nine. So it's really, really small. And then this is about 200, like 300 nanometers or so. And so we have this huge spectrum and we use this all the time, right? Like you use microwaves to heat up your food, you know, and these are really, really long wavelengths. We use radio wavelengths so we can listen to music while we're driving. Uh, or we can use really, really short wavelengths like x-rays, for example. So if you, you know, if you've broken a bone, which I hope you haven't, you have to go to the doctor's office, or if you go to the dentist's office, you've already probably used x-rays to look at like your teeth or look at your bones. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about this, but we can actually take advantage of different areas of the electromagnetic spectrum in order to study molecules, atoms, and look at all these different types of things. So as an example, infrared light is actually really useful because, and I love this, I love this GIF. I'm a huge fan of GIFs. I use them all the time. Uh, infrared light molecules actually wiggle and vibrate. And so the wavelength of infrared light is the same wavelength as these little wiggles in a molecule. And so a molecule actually has all different types of motions. And so we can actually get like a molecule fingerprint from when it absorbs different energies of infrared light. And so that's one way that we can learn about different types of materials that are present in an object. 
we can also use x-rays and I'm going to talk a little bit about in like more detail about how we use x-rays but what x-rays do and this is the same actually the same exact way that it works very similar in you know if you go to the dentist's office or if you go to the doctor's office and you have to get an x-ray it actually tells you about atoms and so ha if you have learned about the periodic table you know that we have lots of different atoms and so when an atom so you have its core so it has uh, neutrons and those are you know neutrally charged particles and protons which are positively charged particles and it has electrons that surround that core and electrons are negatively charged x-rays will actually interact with the electrons of an atom and similar to how molecules interact the kind of wiggles of molecules interact with infrared light the electrons of atoms interact with x-rays and so every element actually has its own unique x-ray fingerprint and heavier things like lead things like that so you know if you, again if you ever go to the dentist you know how they put that like really heavy blanket on you that's actually made out of lead and the reason why is because lead is really good at absorbing x-rays so that lead blanket that they put on you is going to absorb all of the x-rays and that makes sure that the rest of your body isn't actually being exposed to x-rays so we actually use that in order to you know see things like bones for example all right so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to show you a few examples of how we can use different types of light to study different parts of an object you know like a painting or something like that so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at x-rays so you can imagine that the x-rays are going to go all the way through they're going to go all the way through the painting kind of like how when we get an x-ray at the doctor's office you're pretty much you can see through your body right it's a very similar concept for paintings and so can anybody guess why we would use x-rays to look at something like a painting for example based off of this kind of diagram what do, what do you think we could see with x-rays that we may not be able to just see with our eyes what do you think go ahead and type in the chat Any thoughts on what we may be able to see with our with x-rays that our eyes would not be able to see with like a painting it's okay if you don't know okay so the artist may have used different layers of different materials um, to create the piece of art yeah so maybe maybe there's stuff underneath the surface right that we can't necessarily see and maybe we can use x-rays to do that brush strokes yeah definitely yeah let's see what we can see because yeah different types of pigments yeah so you know i was just talking about how x-rays can actually give us an element fingerprint um we can also take advantage of that yeah excellent mm -hmm. all right so we there are actually kind of two different with types of ways that we can use x-rays so this is a a painting by pablo picasso this was during his blue period as you can tell i'm sure but when we look at this so what you're seeing in the center picture is like an x radiograph so when we talk about an x radiograph we're just we're sending x-rays through our sample and we're looking at so the bright spots are areas that absorb lots of x-rays so again you can think about like heavy elements like lead for example um, if you were to look at the periodic table and then the darker areas are places where it has lighter so you have less x-rays being absorbed and so you can actually see a lot of detail so you can kind of think of this as like us taking this painting to the doctor's office and seeing what's going on right so what you can actually see is you see this frame that's actually the, the the wooden support that the canvas is mounted to and then can anyone guess what these these are around the edges see all these little 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 nubs here what do you think what are those that we're seeing around the edges these nails mm -hmm. yeah they're nails yeah so when we wrap a canvas onto a support right 
we can use like staples. Most of the time, if you would go to the art store, they use staples, but you know, before people would use nails to hammer in the canvas and mount it onto its support. But if we actually start to take a look at these sort of, you know, features associated with the painting, you can kind of see the head a little bit. You can see the shape of the body. You know, we can see all this stuff, but we see something else, right? What I see, I see maybe something that looks a little bit like a hand, potentially. Uh, I also see this kind of shape here, as well as this thing that looks almost like a, you know, like a column with a vase on it is what that looks like. To me, that has nothing to do with this, you know, this person that's kind of sitting in the corner. And so actually what this is, is this is a, a specific map for lead. So again, the X radiograph is just like looking at X rays either being absorbed or passing through the surface, similar to how you would go to the doctor's office and get an X ray. This is specific for a single pigment. So that is lead. So typically lead is used as, a, or was used historically, we don't use it really as a white pigment anymore, but it was used as a white pigment, so lead white. And so, you know, you would expect to see it in the, in the light areas, right? We've got the white along the kind of headpiece. We have, you know, the leg area that's kind of bright here and other highlight regions. And so you can, again, you can see that that shows up in the, the lead map is places where you would see that pigment. All right, so let's turn this, let's rotate this a little bit. This to me looks like a landscape painting, right? And it is specifically, I didn't actually add the picture and I should have, but this is actually um, a garden in Barcelona in Spain. And so Picasso was actually living in Spain for a lot of this, this blue period when he painted. And so what people actually, think like the art historians that were studying this and who saw this actually thought that this may have been a reused campus. Um, and so this painting that was underneath that they found was thought to be by the artist Torres Garcia. Um, and so he was a Spanish painter and a very close friend of Picasso's, which is pretty neat. So what the x-rays allow you to do is kind of see underneath the surface, see the things that our eyes cannot. And you know, unfortunately, you know, we can't like peel back the layers of this painting again. We only have one, we can't destroy it. So we need to use light in order to actually be able to tease out these things. So remember I was saying that every element on the periodic table has its own element, kind of like element fingerprint. We can kind of think of it this way. And the reason why is because every atom has its own unique number of electrons. And remember that the X-rays interact with the electrons of your atom. And so what we can do is we can actually take a really, really finely focused x-ray source and we can step it along the surface at very, very, very precise steps. And what we can do is we can make element pictures. So we can take what you end up getting at each point is something that looks like this. And I know this looks a little kind of like, oh my gosh, there's so much information here, which is true. But you can see that every element is going to have its own signature. So I see sulfur, I see chlorine, I see potassium, I see calcium. There's lots of different elements here. So we can actually create pictures of each individual element by taking like, say, I want to map the intensity of this, this little peak here across my surface. So I can do that for each individual element because I know the energies of each signal for each specific element of the periodic table. And so then what I can do is I can go ahead and I can pull out my data and here's what I find. So iron, so iron oxide is like usually like a brownish green pigment. There's cadmium. So cadmium is kind of interesting. So we talked about cadmium a little bit in the beginning, right? So it can be anywhere from like yellowish to orangish to red. And so what this looks like is like, there's a lot of cadmium in this sort of body area. So probably I would guess yellow to make this green, right? There's a lot of zinc. Zinc was used as a white pigment. Uh, there's a lot of barium. Barium is also used as white pigment. And then there's lead everywhere, right? So this is actually an even more sensitive image, this one here. And it may possibly be that, you know, Picasso may have like painted the over with white potentially uh, first. 
And so you can literally do this for, you know, any kind of painting. You can pull out any element that you see and it can tell you about the different types of pigments throughout the surface, both on the surface and both beneath the surface. So you can see both, which I think is just like the coolest thing. All right. So yeah, so I'm actually gonna keep talking about this sample, but we're actually gonna switch to visible light now. All right, so again, we're switching to visible. And so visible light does not go as deeply, right? So again, if you go to the doctor's office, you get an x-ray, they're not gonna use like a flashlight to look at your bones, that's not how it works. But what visible light can tell us is it can tell us about the color on the surface. And so we can actually kind of get maps of colors. And I'll talk a little bit about another strategy that we use in order to actually study different materials. So remember I said, you can take samples sometimes. Again, they're really, really small. So what we did is we had a conservator who you can kind of think of them as the doctors of art. They, like, they are the ones that take care of the art and we're like the researchers. We figure out what's going on. So you take a really tiny little blade and you can chip off a little piece. People usually do it at the edges so you can't really see that there's anything missing. And so what this is, kind of imagine you had a layer cake, right? This is what's called a cross section. So we are looking at the layers from the top of the painting. So that layer four would be the top of the painting all the way down to the bottom, which is layer one. And so the reason why this sample was taken is because people are actually curious about the, it was posed by the curators working on the painting that the painting underneath was actually a sunset painting. And so they were curious about the different colors that were used because, you know, looking at these bright reds and oranges, right? This does not actually match with that. So, you know, even looking this already, I would say, you know, using these types of colors, I would use this if I were painting a sunset or a sunrise piece um, to get that, you know, that very dramatic effect, right? So what you're looking at here is a microscope picture of that teeny tiny sample that we took. And so we mounted it in some, some plastic that cures and we polish it really flat. And now we can get this layer cake image going from the top layer to the bottom layer. Again, we actually have to be able to have permission to take the sample, which doesn't always happen all the time. All right, and so what we can actually do, so I actually helped uh, design a special microscope. And what that special microscope lets you do is it can actually measure the colors of each layer. And so this data that you're looking at here is, you know, we have our visible region of light. So again, we're going from like blue to red and things that you have things that reflect a lot and then you have things that absorb. So the lower the line is, on the graph, the more that it absorbs that color. And so I can actually go in and I can pull out individual spectra, which is what we call this graph, and I can compare it to, you know, known reference materials. So this little thing that looks like a little Pac-Man ghost up here, that is, you know, this blue color. And we found that it matched really good with a mixture of white and blue pigments. So ultramarine and Prussian blue are blue pigments. So that makes sense, right? So this is your spectrum from that. And you can see that it, it absorbs red light. So that means that it's reflecting blue. So we see it as blue. And then here's the reference material. Again, we could do this layer by layer. So then we have three. This matched really well with vermilion, which is a red pigment. And again, this is like a paint layer that we prepared this orange spectrum here. And then again, we can do this, we can keep going, where this was actually a mix of blue and red. And the really cool thing about this microscope is that you can actually, like the, the sensitivity is so good where we can actually zoom in on individual particles within a layer and we can actually measure the color spectrum of single particles in a layer. So you can see here in this blue layer, in layer number two, it's mostly blue, but you can see there's little like flecks of red, right? And so we can actually zoom in, we can select that pigment, and then we can look at the color of that. And so it ends up that this was a carmine, which is just an organic red 
dye uh, that can be made into a pigment. And so again, this, you know, taking this sample and doing this analysis using visible light can tell us about the chemical identity of the different types of pigments that were used by Torres as opposed to Picasso. And I would say with pretty good confidence that Torres had painted a sunset scene based on the colors that were used in these low layers. All right, so now this is kind of last thing we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about ultraviolet light. So if any of you have ever kind of played with a black light before, and if you take a black light and you shine it on something and it glows, that's what we like to use ultraviolet light for. And that is a thing called fluorescence. Um, or you can kind of think about like glow in the dark stars that you like put on your ceiling. Very similar process, this idea of like glowing. So we can actually use UV light to watch things glow, which is, I think is very cool. All right. So before we talk about those things, they're, when we think about Greek and Roman statues, they look like this, right? <laughs> Usually their heads are missing, their noses are sometimes missing, hands. But if you were to, you know, say you went, you went to the Getty and you went and looked at all these sculptures, how did you, oh, somebody asked if it was connected to bioluminescence. It is, it's, it's a similar family of a chemical process. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. All right, so if you went and saw these sculptures, how would you describe them to somebody? Are they like, are they colorful or are they kind of blah? You know, what do you, what do you think? How would you describe these to somebody if you went to the museum and you went and you saw all these objects? All right, how about this? Does everyone know the like little response thing on Zoom? The clothes look real, okay, let's see. The clothes look realistic, but the petite girls make the person look kind of stiff. There's no color, unlike paintings, yeah. So they're, they're white, they're not painted. They're, you know, very stoic. Um, I'm still amazed that people can actually make things look like clothes using something like stone. I don't think I could ever do that personally. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, they look somewhat realistic, uh, you know, things like that, but not colorful, right? I would never describe these as colorful to somebody. No way. All right. Oops, there we go. So what if I told you that these things were actually painted? A lot of these sculptures were actually painted at one point in their life. And so, you know, the question came up of like, why do we use these tools, these super sensitive tools, to look at things that were made long, 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 long time ago. And again, one of the reasons why is because things that may have existed, like paint, don't exist anymore. And so we need these really sensitive tools in order to actually try to understand how did these things look when they were first made, you know, because the way that we think about things like ancient Greece, for example, right, we think about these like, pearly white marble sculptures and things like that. What if they weren't actually like that? What if they were actually super colorful and like painted all these crazy things? And so a bunch of recent research on these, you know, Greek and Roman sculptures actually is bringing into question a lot of the things that we thought that we knew about Greek and Roman art. And actually my background is, uh, is the Greek and Roman galleries at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. All right, so here's a modern photograph of this uh, funerary stele. It's just a, it's like a, it's a sculpture of a vase pretty much. If we take a black light and we shine it on the entirety of the surface, you can clearly tell that there's, there was some stuff there that we can't see as well anymore. And actually, once you pull this up, you can sort of see you're like, oh, this is a little bit darker. There's like some stuff over here too. Okay, I, I kind of see it. And like maybe there are some decorative elements like up here as well. And so when I start to look at this under the black light, I'm like, okay, there's there's something up here. There's like some design on this. There's two people here. Uh, there's also some kind of decorative design here and here. And so if we sort of use our imagination and we use a little bit of chemical analysis, we can sort of make guesses about how this may have looked 
when it was first painted. Because again, these things are super faded now um, because maybe everything like the paints didn't stick or they faded due to the light. And so people have made sort of these approximations of like, oh, maybe this is what it looked like, you know, when it was first painted. It's like really vivid, really bright, really colorful. And when I first saw this, it really kind of blew my mind because we don't think of like Greek and Roman sculpture in this way. We think of these being very, like very kind of monotone in a way. Um, and so again, having the scientific tools can really help us kind of answer these questions and make us think a little bit differently about things that we thought we were that we thought were true about historical objects. So let's take a look at another object. Uh, this is a sculpture of Artemis, who is a Greek goddess. Um, and this was found in Pompeii. So if we take a microscope, so we're not looking at black light pictures anymore, but if we take a microscope and we sort of zoom in on her on her face, this is the sort of area around where the crown meets the hair. There's there's a little bit of pink, there's a little bit of color, right? Um, and then similarly, you know, if we look down sort of on the on the drapes on the folds, same deal. It's like I'm seeing, you know, kind of residues of this pink, this pink pigment here. And so again, we can take we can take a little scraping, a little tiny piece, and we can do analysis on it. And it turns out that the the color that was used here, this pink color is derived from something called matter root. And so this is a plant that you can actually dry and you could grind it up and you can use it as a pigment. So you can actually extract the color from the root and you can turn it into a pigment. And this was actually known to be commonly used in painting during the Greek and Roman era. So again, we still use this, you know, in 2021 as an art material but it was also used during ancient Greek and Roman times. So, you know, it's thought to believe that this is, you know, it's legit, the residues that we find, but again, it's really faded. Time has not been so kind to it. And so, you know, like I said earlier, that most of the pigment on the sculpture has either flaked off or degraded because of light over time. But with the tools that we have, you know, maybe it originally looked like this, right? So we have the, the pink color, we have, you know, the pink here. And I really like this example because it shows you how sensitive these scientific tools that we have are, um, but it also shows it, you that science can actually help you sort of create these like new narratives for kind of like historical objects that we, you know, we thought we knew everything, but we actually discovered something brand new and something is quite shocking. So the this actually, this exhibit that showed these, it's called Gods in Color. I can send the link uh, if people are interested, but it really like shook people up uh, because again, our kind of notion of what these, these sculptures are supposed to look like. All right, and so we have about 15 minutes left and I figured I would leave this time for questions. I actually have a few extra slides too. Um, I'm also happy to show those, but I did want to leave some time for you all to ask questions. So either type it in the chat uh, or you can just go ahead um, and maybe use like the raise hand function. And we can um, actually, Adrian, if you want to field the questions, that'd be excellent. Okay, thank you. All right. I can ask one. I can ask one. I can yeah, sure. It sounds great. I um, since you have to probably deal with things that may have lead and stuff in them. What would do you guys um, dress a, in a, in different materials or have to be really careful how you handle? Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah. So actually, I uh, when I worked on the Japanese woodblock prints, uh, I was working on, uh, they had arsenic, some of the pigments had arsenic in them, which is just as toxic as lead. 
but pretty much for the most part, they're used in a relatively low concentration. So as long as you're wearing gloves uh, and wearing goggles and a lab coat, you're fine. And you know, you don't lick your hands after you're done touching the work of art. Um, when things kind of get a little bit more dicey is like if something has like a lot of mold, like a growth on it, or it's very powdery, um, then you can, you know, you can wear like an N95 mask uh, to protect yourself from inhaling particles. Again, gloves, but typically when we work in the labs, gloves, lab coat, goggles, very, very much like working in like a normal science lab. Let's see, I have, I think I see some questions in the chat. So yeah, so we just wear like kind of normal, you know, protective equipment, gloves, yeah, things like that. That usually keeps us safe. All right, so I see, let's see. I'll answer this one because it's actually relatively short first, but I will get all to, to all the questions in the chat. Uh, what college did you study at? Somebody asked. Uh, so I will actually backtrack a little bit because I kind of gave an introduction on that. So give me one second. Pull up the slide. Where is it? I've got too many things up. All right. So I, uh, I'm actually a brand new Californian. I live in the Bay Area right now, but I'm originally from the New York City metropolitan area. And I went to Barnard College. Uh, so Barnard College is a uh, women's liberal arts institution. So anyone who self-identifies as a woman um, can go to Barnard. It's also across the street from Columbia University. And then that's where I actually was able to get into the museum research because I did an internship at the Metropolitan Museum when I was in college. And then I went back there after I finished my PhD. All right, so what was your average day like? What's your favorite part about your job and what has been your favorite project so far? Ooh, that's a good question. So my current job as a professor, I do a lot of teaching, right? So a lot of my days spent preparing lectures, giving lectures, meeting with students, uh, grading, things like that. When I worked in the museum setting, uh, you know, the day-to-day -day was a little bit different. You know, everybody's got answer emails. I actually did a lot of writing. You spend a lot of time reading and writing. So even as a scientist, having really good like reading and writing research skills as well as communication skills is really important. Um, because I also, you know, I would have meetings with people who weren't scientists. So imagine you have all this like super technical data and you've got to meet with a bunch of people that aren't scientists. So you really have to know your stuff in order to actually communicate with people uh, what you do and like what your results mean in kind of like a broader context, right? Not just the chemistry of what's going on. So, you know, it's it's typically like answering emails, writing, reading, you know, object analysis doesn't actually like going into the galleries and doing object analysis. You know, it happens, it depends, but I would say maybe like once a week or, you know, you're doing data analysis, uh, but the actual like taking the data depending on the project is actually not as much time, unfortunately, as you would like. But I would take, one of the cool things about working in a museum is that you can take breaks by just going and walking around the galleries and then just going back to your, your office, which is was so awesome. I don't have that anymore and I miss it so much. <laughs> and then I think my favorite project uh, was definitely working on the Japanese woodblock prints. I may have pictures of some of them that I worked on, but they may be in a different presentation. Um, I had a lot of fun with that project. Let's see, do I actually have it in here? I think I have it in another presentation. So I will, um, I can share that at the very end, but yeah, the Japanese prints are just amazing. And I had a lot of time sort of like examining them visually, just using a regular microscope and like seeing all the little details from the printed blocks and like seeing how they differ from print to print um, and like looking at the pigments under a microscope, it's so much fun. I could look at stuff under a microscope all day, but I guess that's a good fit for, you know, my job. <laughs> okay, let's see. Next question. I have an old statue. If I have an old statue, where can I go to see if it has been painted and how old it is? That is a great question. So there are scientists that work in museums like I have. Um, there are also actually private firms that do this. So say, for example, you were, you know, like some super rich, fancy collector and you wanted to buy a sculpture and you wanted to confirm, you know, get some information about like, you know, when it was made, the pigments that were used, 
you could actually hire uh, like an analysis firm to do that work for you. So there are like private kind of conservators, there are private scientists that actually do this type of work, or there's folks like us in the museum. So when I was at the Met, I analyzed this little um, ancient Egyptian sculpture that was potentially going to be purchased by the museum. And we found some like red pigment residue on there and I analyzed it and it was just iron oxide. So I was like, well, it makes sense, but I can't tell you whether or not that was like a modern addition or not, because again, something like an iron oxide, like rust, you know, has been used since ancient Egypt and still is used today. Um, but, you know, again, if the, the red pigment was something that was like contemporary, I'd be like, uh oh, this isn't good. Like, I don't know what this is. <laughs> All right, let's see. What are the most common materials you found during the Greek and Roman time period? So that's a good question. It depends. Um, a lot of sort of earth pigments, uh, so you can, and things like black, for example, were actually uh, like carbon black. So you know, if like you have a barbecue or like you have a stick and you burn it and it just turns into black soot, you can actually use that as a pigment. And so people would use that as a pigment or like, you know, iron oxide. So again, rust, you can kind of think of that like powder, um, a lot of organic things. So like that matter root, for example, was very commonly used as a red or a purple pigment. Um, it actually depends on the acidity of the solution that it's originally made, it can change colors. So it's like an acid or base indicator too. Um, but yeah, I can actually send there are like lots of fun sort of like historical pigment timelines and you can sort of see like when certain pigments were developed over history. But like the palette of like the Greek and Roman era is like relatively simple. Um, you know, lots of earth, lots of earth pigments, lots of naturally derived things, right? Yeah. All right, what types of art forms are the most common? Painting, statues, etc. That's a good question. It depends on where you work. So if I was a scientist at somewhere like the Met, the Met is what's classified as an encyclopedic collection. So they have everything going from like, you know, ancient peoples all the way up to like contemporary artists. So when you work as a scientist in that thing, you need to have a handle of like, I need to understand plastics and I need to understand like oil paint and I need to understand like ancient Greek and Roman sculpture. You need to have a handle on everything. So having really good which really helps you in that. But if you work somewhere like a library, you're working with a lot of things like paper, you know, maps, illustrations, watercolors, things like that. It really depends on where you work. Um, who's my favorite artist? Oh, that's a really hard question. <laughs> that's a very hard question. It changes from day to day. My current favorite artist, and I'll type her name in the chat. Her name is Leonora Carrington. Um, I also love Frida Kahlo, both kind of in the surrealist thing, but they, Leonor Car Carrington, I think she was British, but she moved to Mexico and was like part of the kind of like surrealist art scene there in like the early 20th century. That's Leonor Carrington is my current favorite artist. And then what did you find out about the Japanese blocks? That's also a great question. Let me really quick change my presentation and I will tell you a little bit about what I did. One second. And please keep typing your questions in the chat. I love them. They are great. And I can also um, I can also give you my email if you have more questions that we didn't get to. Okay. So I was working on a specific set of prints by Hokusai. So you know again the you know the big wave print, same artist, same, same guy. And you can sort of see that theme, right? You got the water theme going on here. And so the Met had uh, two sets of these prints. So these are famous waterfalls in Japan. And this is the second set. They're quite different, yeah? And so what we were curious about is we were curious specifically about the blues and the yellows that were used, because you can see the blue is, there's a lot of blue. Another thing that was really cool to look at, you know, how you can see all these little kind of like markings and things like that. So when I was doing a lot of that just visual analysis, that the shape of a lot of these was different from, you know, I call this set one, like the more colorful set and set two. But I also did a lot of kind of pigment characterization. And so, you know, again, this is 
thinking about the use of like these novel dyes and thinking about Japan like becoming more westernized uh past 1860 things get crazy colorful there's reds there's purples there's blues there's everything so you can actually date Japanese prints partially by the color so around the 1820s they started to use a lot of blue this Prussian blue which was imported from Europe um, and so we were actually interested in connecting the pigments that we found with the date that was assigned to these prints. You know, these prints were kind of like like fancy souvenirs, like an expensive like postcard that you would get. You kind of think about it that way. Um, you know, they were very widely available. I saw, I, re I remember reading a document that they like cost as much as a bowl of noodles. So you can kind of think about it that way. And so we used a bunch of different, you know, fancy scientific equipment. So, you know, this is sitting in the basement of the museum. Now you know. And, you know, we can look at the different types of pigment forms. So we were curious about whether or not the yellow that they were using. So remember I said I was working with arsenic, which people don't use anymore because it's a little, to a little toxic. <laughs> uh, so there's a natural form and it has this like gorgeous bright yellow color. If you look at it under a microscope, the particles are relatively large and they're also very flat and shiny. You can also make a what's called like a synthetic version of this by heating up really, really hot arsenic oxide, which is a white arsenic uh, material and like sulfur. You know, sulfur is really stinky. And then what you form is this sort of what's called a glass. Um, so this is not as shiny and like ordered as the natural arsenic mineral. And you can clearly tell that from the microscope, look at our microscope, right? You've got, it's like really round, whereas this is very sharp. The particles are smaller. Um, and so we were actually looking at these two different types of pigments in those two sets of prints. And so, you know, you can see it under the microscope. This is this, uh, remember I was talking about that vibrating molecule fingerprint? This is that. So this is the natural form of that mineral. It's got this really sharp, beautiful molecular, you know, these vibrations. So these different energies of those wiggles in the molecule. And we can also look at it using a fancier microscope. So looking at the, the particle sizes, looking at the elemental content, and we can do element maps too, like I've already shown you. And so this is the glassy one. So this looks totally different, right? It's got this big, big band, whereas the other one was like really sharp, really defined. And because this, this glassy material is not as ordered as the natural material, the the molecular vibrations kind of all like they kind of all just like smear together and so what you end up getting is this like big broad thing as opposed to those really sharp bands of those vibrations that we had seen earlier and again this is with the sort of like the like the duller set of the of the prints yeah so again we can look at the, the particles under the, the microscope we can do element maps we can see arsenic and sulfur which we would expect and we can sort of do an approximation of the uh, relative amounts of the two, of the arsenic and the sulfur. And so what we found is that, you know, the, the really bright, beautiful set used this like natural pigment, and then the uh, other set used the artificial type. And I also did like lots of historical research, so much time. I spent so much time in the library, which was actually really fun. It's cool as like a scientist to also be able to like read about history stuff because uh, I don't know if we do that all the time and so essentially what I was able to do is like kind of readjust the uh, approximate dates of these different things based on our pigment findings and we actually found that these were dated as like 1827 but it turns out it actually should have been a little bit later but that's even you know it's even a matter of five years so we were actually able to make that really small correction just by using scientific data All right, so that that is all I have. Um, I think it's 530. Uh, I'm happy to stick around for another, you know, like five or 10 minutes if folks have more questions. Uh, but I will, I will give uh, Adrian my email. So if you have more questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them um, or share resources with you. I have one more question before. We yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, this was so interesting. I, I didn't know that people put this much effort into art 
like this. And I love mm -hmm. the beautiful colors, especially in the yeah. uh, Japanese art. But um, when you finish a project, mm -hmm. do you um, publish it in some kind of journal or? Um, yeah, that's a great, that's a really good question. It depends on the project. So it's kind of interesting. So like we start working, scientists will like work the, with the conservators. So the people that take care of the art or curators. So like the people that actually, you know, like study all the art history stuff. And I'll be like, oh, I have this question. Like we have this thing and like, we're not sure what's really going on with it. And sometimes, you know, we do an analysis. It's like one and done. You write a report uh, that gets kind of stashed in the museum's like archive and that's it. But then sometimes we'll analyze stuff and like all these questions will come up and then we start digging deeper and deeper and then we take more data and then that usually leads to a publication. Um, yeah, so it really depends on the project. Uh, and you know, usually like similar to other scientific fields, there are some things that are a little bit like hotter and trendier as far as the research goes. So like people are actively like looking at those things. Yeah. Um, so it really depends, yeah. That's great. Mm -hmm. I like to read one of yours when you- Sure, <laughs> I, so actually the, the Japanese print work is published and it is freely available. Uh, it's an, in an open access journal. And I think that the, it's pretty, I mean, y'all got the gist of it. So, you know, I think that you could all read it, no problem. Perfect. Anybody have any more questions? All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Like, like she said, um, she's going to uh, give me, I already have her email. So if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to contact me and I'll, yeah. um, I've, I've done this before. So um, we also would like you to come back if you can. We usually, <laughs> we usually like to keep everybody on rotation every six Sure. Months will ask you to come again. I would love to, if uh, you will have me. <laughs> we would love to have you. And by then we'll have even more questions for you. Yes, I love it. That sounds awesome. That would be perfect. But anyway, um, you guys, I'll let you have your Friday back. <laughs> um, we'll be seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Z. Dr. Z. That's my gumpy your name. <laughs> so, um, you guys have a great weekend and we'll talk to you next week. All right. All right. Sounds good. Bye everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It was so great to talk to you all. Thank you. You too. All, all right. right. Thank Bye. You.